Today, we're going to be talking about perhaps, not perhaps, it is the most important question you'll ever, ever have to answer in your life. Your eternity depends upon that. And the question is this, who do you say Jesus is? That's the question. So uh, before we get into our text, which is going to be in Matthew chapter 16, I want to talk a little bit of what's happening in the upper story. As we've been going through the story, you know that there is this upper story, this grand scale where God is at work. He's at work at the 30,000 foot level. God has a plan for humanity. He's a plan for us. And sometimes when we're at the lower level, at the 100 foot level, we don't see the big picture. And so today I'll start again with the upper story or the big picture of what God's doing. In, in Matthew chapter 16, or as we're going to the story here in Matthew or chapter 25, what's happening is Jesus, for the first time, is introducing the word church. Up to this time, the word church hasn't been used in the Old Testament, it hasn't been used in the New Testament. And now he says, I'm going to build my church. So we know the church is his. It's a bold declaration. He doesn't say, I'm going to build God's church. He, builds, he says, I'm going to build my church. So that's a claim of his deity. And then he also says, this church is, is, not, is going to prevail. It's never going to be snuffed out. And you can look back over 2,000 years of history. There's been many attacks on the church, but the church is flourishing today. Contrary to what you might hear in the media, and you do see churches closing and things going down. It's often, a, oh, church is on the decline. Well, you have to just know around the world, the church is actually flourishing. Church is flourishing in China. The church is flourishing in different parts of the world. And there's seasons, as there has been throughout history, where it'll go through a pruning, but then it just comes back and flourishes even more. And that's what you're going to see in the years to come. The church is going to flourish even more. I think we're in a bit of a pruning season in North America right now. But you'll see the church again will flourish. Why? Because Jesus said, I will build my church. So back there in uh, Matthew chapter 16, the upper story, he's saying, I'll build my church. Now, that word hadn't been used as a, as a Christian term prior to this. It was a Greek word, ecclesia, and ecclesia just meant a group of people that gathered together in community. That's what it meant. And so church is all about community and gathering together. An interesting thing, though, that his audience would have known when he said, I will build my church, Ecclesia was a gathering of people, but only for free people. A slave was never invited to the Ecclesia. And how many know in Christ we're free? There's no slaves. He set us free from a slavery to sin, and we're free through Christ. So that speaks of freedom. And the church speaks of freedom. So he introduces this concept of church. And then he would say in this text that uh, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. In this text, there's this revelation of who Jesus is. And he would tell Peter, upon that rock, upon that revelation, I'm going to build my church. So in the big picture, upper story, Jesus is pronouncing, he's proclaiming, he's prophesying, if you like, that I will build my church. We're going to go into a new dispensation, a new age. The old covenant is finished. We're coming into a new covenant. It's a time of my church. So that's what's happening on the upper story. Jesus has been waiting for this. He's the head of the church. And so this is what's happening on the upper story. Let's go to the lower story. What's happening at, the, at ground level in Matthew chapter 16. Mark also records it in his gospel, Mark chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. And would you say with me this morning, thank you, Lord, for the book of Matthew. Yeah, Matthew chapter 16. We're going to be reading from verse 13 to 19. And by the way, if you, if you don't have your Bible with you, like a, a, a hard copy like this, get on your phone, get the app. Coastal Church app or a Bible app. It's easy to follow along on the Coastal Church app. The notes are there as well. So if you haven't already done so, we encourage you to download that. Easy to do, then easy to follow along. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take Matthew chapter 16, starting there in verse 13. I'm just going to break it down verse by verse. We'll go through it. So maybe a little more of a teaching today. But this is really, really important because it's the biggest question we ever have to answer in our life. So I think we should spend some time on really understanding it. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 starts out with, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. 
He came into that region. So he's asking the question in a very specific spot. He's not doing anything by accident. He didn't just say, you guys, let's go for a hike today. This was north of the Sea of Galilee, near Mount Hermon. It was a very nice spot. It was, had uh, a nice stream that flowed through there, beautiful. Cheryl and I have been there when we've gone to Israel. If you come to Israel with us, we'll, we'll take you to this spot. It's, it's a beautiful spot in nature, but also it was a place that was very dark spiritually. So he, he takes them there on purpose to make the proclamation that he's going to build his church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. If you go to that site, they have a picture there of what it would look like in the time Jesus had visited. So I'll put that on the screen today. This is a picture that they'll give you when you go there. And this is what it would look like, according to the artist, when Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi. This is not the Caesarea that's on the Mediterranean Ocean. This is a different Caesarea Philippi. Originally, it was called Pania, after the goddess Pan, the Greek goddess, half goat, half man, a very perverted god. That's where we get our word panic from. So he, he's going to this area, and they would have been worshiping Pan. Now, it's called Caesarea Philippi because Philip, who was the governor under Rome, he names it Caesarea Philippi, and gives it a new name. And as a result of it, he builds a temple over here on this far side for, it's called the Temple of Augustus, Augustus Caesar. You can see behind there, there's a cave. And they believed that cave had the gates to hell. They would look into that dark grotto and they would say, okay, this is where the spiritual world is. And they had all kinds of weird, perverted sacrifices, which I won't talk about this morning, that took place there. And this is again where Jesus is taking his disciples. Jesus is in his 30s, but his disciples aren't. They're 18, 19, early 20s. So he's taken to a place that, quite frankly, would have been pornographic, what was going on. So he takes these young men there, and he says, okay, let's take a look around here. We've got this temple to uh, Augustus. Then over here, we have this court of Pan, this next piece over here. And they had these little things in the wall. You can go there. You can still see these sites. Then they had a, a temple of Zeus over here, another worship place. They had the court of Nemesis over here in this piece here. Nemesis was the goddess of vengeance, so that was happening. And, and then they had uh, uh, a temple, another temple over here. This was the temple of the sacred goats because Pan was the goat. Uh, and then we over here on the far end, they had another temple to Pan and the dancing goats. So, you guys, it was as crazy as you're going to get. I mean, we have crazy things happening in our world today, but this, this scene was crazy. And this is where he takes his disciples. And in this backdrop, he says, when he goes to Caesarea Philippi, reading on verse 13, he asks his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And so they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. And others are saying you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. This is who people say you are. Some say you're John the Baptist. You're a reformer. Some people say you're Elijah. You do miracles. And some say you're Jeremiah. You're, you're this amazing communicator. He's asking, who do people say that I am? If we went out in the street today, we went into our city, into your home, your workplace, and you ask people, who is Jesus? What do you think they would say? Let's, let's get some shout out back from the audience. Help me out here today. If you asked in your workplace or if you went out to your, uh, your, your colleagues or your relatives who weren't necessarily churchgoers, who would they say Jesus is? Can anybody give me a shout out from this area? A prophet. A prophet. Okay. A, teacher. a good teacher. God. Okay. Anybody else? What would, your, what would the world say? Religious leader. A myth, yeah. Anybody else? What would, what would the, who, who do people say? He asked them. It wasn't like Jesus didn't know. When Jesus asks a question or God asks a question, we always know he knows the answer, right? He's not coming to us like, oh, I can't figure this out. Can you please help me? He knew. Uh, but he's wanting them to think about it. He wants us to think about it today. So uh, one more. Who, do you, who does the world say Jesus is? 
I don't know. Yeah, that's a good answer. I don't know. Haven't thought about it. Don't want to think about it, maybe. So this is what our world is saying today. And he asked them, who does... Who do people say that Jesus is? Now, they gave some good answers, as we heard today, but they all underestimated who Jesus really is. They fall short of honoring him as God, as deity, the Son of God. It's interesting, back in 1929, the Saturday Evening Post did an interview of Albert Einstein, one of the brightest minds in the world, a mathematician. You know his, his story. You know he was a great physicist. And Albert Einstein, when he was asked, he said, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. I I like what he had to say here. His personality pulsates in every word. Isn't that a good description of the Gospels? Here's this bright mind. I don't know if he was a, became a Christian or ever confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, but he knew when you read the Bible, there's something about this Jesus. There's something about him. C.S. Lewis, a very famous Christian writing. If you're not familiar with him, I encourage you to read his book, Mere Christianity. In his book, Mere Christianity, and this is, again, a brilliant mind who thought through things. He became a Christian, and here's what he had to say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said, the sort of things he said, would not be a great moral teacher. He'd be either a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Well, what did Jesus say? Why would C.S. Lewis say that the sort of things he says, you have to be a lunatic to say them? We heard today people say, oh, he's a good teacher, he's a moral leader, he's a prophet. And for the most part, people respect Jesus as somebody who had a positive influence on the world. So what did Jesus say that was so controversial that C.S. Lewis would say, well, you know, you could call him a lunatic. What did he say? Here's a couple things Jesus said, just as a reminder, you'll know these claims he made. He claimed to be the son of God. Now, when I say these Think if your friend came to you and said, you know what, I'm the son of God. You might go, "Eh, really? And if he came back to you and said, "Uh, angels actually obey me. Oh, really? Okay. Um, I have ultimate, I can, I will be judging all mankind. I I will be judging all mankind. Uh, I have power to forgive sin. Um, I can raise people from the dead. You'd be like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. What drug are you on? Like, what happened to you? And if he went on to say, I could raise myself from the dead. And if he went on to say, I'm the only way to God, I can give eternal life. If somebody said that today to you, you might go, you need some special help. (laughs) Special help. But these are the claims that Jesus made. So no wonder Lewis says that uh, you have to make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him or kill him as a demon. You can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about us being a great human teacher. He has not left that open for us. He did not intend to. He wants to bring you and I and everybody, humanity, to a place where we have to make a choice. What's the choice? Is he the son of God or isn't he? That's that's where we're at. This is a crucial place in the story. And he's bringing in this lower story the disciples to talk about it in the backdrop of a very dark, perverted place. Who do you say that I am? You have all these other gods. Who do you say that I am? So in verse 15, he asks that question. He says to the disciples, but who do you say that I am? So he asks us this morning, watching online, Who do you say that Jesus is? Who is he? It's fine for us to think what other people may think he is, but God wants us to think about who do I say that he is? Now, how do we get an answer to that? Here's here's a couple ways we can get an answer to that question. Somebody said, well, if you ask people who Jesus is, I don't know who he is. How do I find out who he is? Well, I would study the Bible. The Bible is the best source to find out who Jesus is. The prophecies, the writings of our disciples will help you understand who Jesus is. That's the best source. 
then you want to under, if you want to understand who Jesus is, you have to study his resurrection. Everything pivots on that. Then you can study all of creation speaks to him as being a creator. We have a very famous telescope in the skies. I think it's since been retired called the Kepler telescope, which brought us amazing pictures from space. And Kepler was this great astronomer who said, I believe only and alone in the service of Jesus Christ. In him is all refuge and solace. Here's the great Kepler in the 1600s saying, I believe in this Jesus. So you see him in creation. You'll see him in the Bible. You also see him throughout history. From when he came to this world, and even before that, we see the, the, the impact of Jesus on history cannot be ignored. Do you agree? I mean, you'd really have to have your head in the sand to say Jesus didn't influence the world. Historian H.G. Wells, who was not a Christian, he said, I'm an historian, I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history. Mic drop. There you go. He just, he just says, that's it. I'm not a believer, but you cannot ignore this. So we get it from history. We get it from creation, from the Bible, the proof of his resurrection. Perhaps one of the best ways to know that Jesus is the Son of God is the way he changes lives today. He has been changing lives for the past 2,000 years. How many here this morning watching our campus online would say, Jesus changed my life? He's changed my life. Changed my life. And, uh, you know, one of the great musicians in our world today, Bono, the lead singer for U2, he was doing an inter given an interview in 2013, and the person interviewing him had asked him the question of who is Jesus because they knew he, from his his songs, his, his, his messaging, that he was a follower, and he asked him who he, Jesus was. And Bono replied, I don't think you're let off easily by saying a great thinker or a great philosopher. And he doesn't let us off easy. He's not letting you off easy today. Because, Bono went on to say, Jesus went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the son of God. He either, in my view, was the son of God or he was. And at that point when he said he was, the interview jumps in and says he was not. And Bono says, no, 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 that's not what I said. He was either the son of God or he was nuts. And Bono goes on to say, forget rock and roll messianic complexes. This is like Charlie Manson type of delirium. And I find it hard to accept that, the, that whole millions and millions of lives, half of the earth for 2,000 years, have been touched, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I just don't believe it. And I'm with Bono. I don't believe it. I don't believe so many lives could be positively changed, reassured, impacted, set free if there wasn't something to this Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So you can see it throughout history. He is the Son of God. You see the lives around you. And so our prayers, God, open people's eyes to see the beautiful Jesus, the Son of God. Later on in the interview, they asked Bono, therefore, it follows you believe Jesus was divine. You know what he responded? Yes. That was it. Yes. He's divine. He's deity. He's the Son of God. That's the right answer. Simon Peter, in verse 16, going back to our text, answered Jesus and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He knew what the culture of the day thought. He'd heard it. He'd lived around it. He had the backdrop of all these other gods. But Simon gets it. And uh, he had, the Father God had revealed it to him. And we, too, need God to reveal to us who Jesus really is. You are the Christ. I don't know about you, but for a long time, I, I made the stupidest mistake. I thought Christ was Jesus' last name. I thought his dad's name was Joseph Christ, and this was Jesus Christ, his son. 
And I grew up thinking that. It took me a long time to figure it out. One day, it dawned on me that Christ wasn't his last name. That was his title. He's the Messiah. Christ means the anointed one. It means the one who's going to save people and set people free. And uh, when we say Jesus the Christ, we're saying, Jesus, you're the anointed one. You're called by God. You're the Messiah. You are the deliverer that sets people free from darkness. So in verse 17, picking up our text, if you're following along in your Bibles, Jesus answered and said to them, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father. See, in order to see Jesus as the Son of God, we need the Holy Spirit to reveal that to us. And that's why we pray. Prayer does that. Prayer helps people see who Jesus really is. Then he went on to say, And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. What is the rock? The rock is the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the main pillar that he builds the entire church. Peter never claimed to be the rock. As a matter of fact, in his letter in 1 Peter, he says that Jesus is the main rock and we are all living stones that are put into this church building. 1 Peter 2, we read, Welcome to the living stone, the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out. God said in place of honor, present yourself as building stones. So church family, you're stones. I didn't say you're stoned. I said you're stones. So there's, <laughs> you are the living stones. Christ is a foundation stone. That's what he's talking about here. Present yourself as stones, building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life in which you'll serve as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives up to God. The scriptures provide precedent. Look, I'm setting a stone in Zion, a cornerstone in the place of honor. Now watch this. Whoever trusts in this stone, whoever, as a foundation, will never have a cause to regret it. Hallelujah. Wow. You might have some troubles. You might have challenges, but you'll never regret saying, Jesus, you're the Christ. I'm going to build my life on that revelation. We'll finish up here in verse number 19. Then he says to them, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'll give you the keys. I will give you the keys. Did he give them the keys that day? No. When did he give them the keys? On the day of Pentecost. He talked about the church. The church was really birthed on that day of Pentecost. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, he gave them the keys. Keys. Let's talk about keys for a little bit. I, 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 thought, I should have brought up a key. And then I remembered I had a key in my pocket here. So th- this, I'm, you won't be able to see this, but maybe you can. This is a little, little key. Not very big, right? Have you ever lost your key? Amen. Don't put up your hand. We'll all put up our hands if we <laughs> ask that question. Let me, let me ask you a question. When you lose your keys, why do you feel a sense of panic? Why? Do you, <gasps> why? Because the key represents your privacy. The key represents your belongings. It represents your power. It represents authority. It represents responsibility. One little key opens a big room. This is actually the key to our church, and this little key opens this building up. And there's all kinds of stuff in here. Pastor Fermin was with us this past week or so, and he came, and he stayed in our apartment, so I gave him the keys to our apartment. What happened when I gave him the keys to our apartment? He had access to everything in our apartment. I said, help yourself to the fridge, help yourself, make yourself at home. He made coffee, he made avocado toast every morning. Uh, he, had, he, he enjoyed everything in our apartment. Why? Because he had a key. Why did I give him a key? Because I trusted him. I don't give that key to anybody, I gave it to him because I trusted him. And God says to you, I will give you the keys. Do we know how important that is? Think about that. He's given you the keys to what? 
to his apartment, to his car. What did he give us the keys to? To what? The kingdom. The kingdom. To what? The kingdom of what? The kingdom of heaven. This is, in the Old Testament, they call it Selah. Pause and think about that. You and I have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. When you leave the house, if you're like me, I think, do I have my wallet? Do I have my phone? And do I have my keys? Are you the same way? You, you don't leave without them. I've got to make sure I take my keys with us. I think a lot of Christians aren't taking the keys of the kingdom with them into their daily life. Because that key to the kingdom, he said, you'll be able to bind and loose of it. It will give you spiritual authority in the spiritual realm. And with these keys, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. When you say to the spiritual realm, I legally, through the authority of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I legally bind your work. You will not have my family. You will not have my health. You will not have my children. In Jesus' name, you have done something in the kingdom of heaven you would never be able to do except Christ gave that key to you. And why did he give us that key? He says, because my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. These keys open those gates, and when you open that gate, it releases people that are bound in darkness. I'm so glad somebody set me free. I'm so glad somebody brought me out of that place of darkness. How do we have this all? Only through a revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is who he said he was. He proved that through his death, his resurrection, and throughout history we see that he truly is the Messiah. And the Bible tells us, whoever shall confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord, even as Peter did, and the Father's revealing that to you right now, they would be saved. So today, Jesus is inviting you, come, let me live in your life. Let me give you this authority. Let me set you free. But it only happens as we, like Peter, say, I believe and confess that Jesus, you are the Son of God. So wherever you are, would you take a moment to pray with me today? Right after that, we're going to have communion to celebrate what he's done for us. So let's pray together. Pray out loud with me. Wherever you're watching online, please join us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to die for my sins and rise again that I could have life. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Amen.